What's up guys and welcome to another build log. So last week a friend of mine reached out and asked if I could build a PC for him. With a budget of around 1000 US dollars, he asked for a build capable of doing office work like editing, rendering, and some light gaming. He was also not a fan of RGB lighting and asked for a minimalist build. So in this video, we're going to build this request using these parts. The exact part used and its price will be shown as I build the PC. And as usual, I'll show some gaming benchmarks in the end. So let's begin. For the motherboard, I went with Gigabyte's B550M DS3HAC. Priced at around 115 US dollars, this board is relatively cheap for a B550 chipset. With features like PCIe 4 support, 4 DIMM slots, and wireless support, this is one of the better budget B550 motherboards out there. At the heart of this build is a Ryzen 5 5600X, which I got for around 195 US dollars. And to further save up on cash, we're going to use the stock cooler that comes with it. The stock cooler should be enough for the Ryzen 5 5600X if certain conditions are met, like good case airflow, good ambient temps, and if you lower down the core voltage and don't do overclocking. But if you still find your temps too high, I would suggest getting an aftermarket cooler for the chip. For the RAM, I went with 32 gigs of G-Skills Trident Z Neo memory, which I got for around 122 US dollars. This memory kit is rated to run at 3600 MHz, which should be the ideal RAM speeds for this Ryzen setup. Also, I have to mention that we're slowly transitioning to the 32 gig standard era. So you might want to opt for 32 gigs instead of 16 gigs for future proofing. But 16 gigs of RAM should still be fine. For storage, we used 1 terabyte of Crucial's P5 Plus M.2 SSD. With read speeds at around 6,600 megabytes per second and write speeds of 5,000 megabytes per second, you should have no problem with loading times when playing and accessing your precious files. I bought this for around 90 US dollars. For the power supply, I went with Cooler Master's MWE 650 Gold V2, which cost 97 US dollars. Personally, I don't skimp out on power supplies as they have a major effect on the longevity of your PC. This power supply has a rating of plus 80 gold efficiency, fully modular, and is highly regarded by most review sites for being a good mid-range power supply. Not to mention, Cooler Master covers a 5-year warranty on this power supply, so you can expect a replacement if it fails within such period. The case I used for this build is the NZXT H510 Flow. Compared with the standard H510, the H510 Flow uses a front mesh design for better airflow. It also has a compact minimalist design which perfectly suits the preference of my friend who commissioned this. The case supports up to 4 fans, 2 at the front, 1 at the top, and another one at the back. The front and top slots are capable of housing 120 and 140mm fans, while the back slot is only capable of housing 120mm fan. Located at the bottom are the 3.5-inch drive bays which can house up to two drives, with another slot at the top for either 3.5-inch or 2.5-inch drive. Above the power supply are the 2.5-inch drive bays which can house up to two drives. Cable management is also decent as it comes with a cable shroud at the front to hide some cables and cable guides at the back with velcro straps for easy cable management. I got this for a very cheap price of 71 US dollars, which is a steal considering its features. Lastly, I went with MSI Armor RX 6600 for the GPU, which was priced at around 263 US dollars. Initially, I was considering an RTX 3060 for this build, but the price difference between the two was around 50% more, and the RTX 3060 is only marginally better than the RX 6600 so this was a no-brainer. Although having an RTX card will certainly have advantages like DLSS, NVENC encoder, and better ray tracing, the 263 US dollar price tag on the RX 6600 was the nail in the coffin. 
time to close up our build and a little bit of an ASMR for you guys as I remove the plastic covers of the tempered glass. Here's a quick rundown of the parts used and their prices. Do take note that I bought everything locally at the store here in the Philippines. This gives us a total price of 978 US dollars. Before we test this setup, don't forget to enable XMP in the BIOS to make sure that your RAMs are running at 3600 MHz. And also enable 4G decoding for resizable bar support. Now it's time to see how the PC performs. On Valorant, a CPU bound game, the system handles the game pretty well as expected. Even at 1440p, the PC averaged well above 240 FPS, which should be more than enough even for pro players. 1080p is even better as the PC averaged north of 300 FPS. On a side note, the footage seen at the upper left is just a sample of the test and is not the actual test done. Recording using the GPU incurs a performance penalty when playing, and thus I tested without recording for a more accurate result. The streak of high FPS continued on CSGO. On 1080p, it managed to average an astounding 437 FPS while having good 1% lows of 172. Frame times were also good as it averaged only 2.61 milliseconds. Playing on 1440p shouldn't also be a problem as the PC averaged well above 300 FPS with good 1% lows and average frame times. On Dying Light 2, the setup was able to run the game pretty decently as it averaged 68 FPS on 1080p while having 55 FPS on 1% lows and frame time average of 14.75 milliseconds. On 1440p, however, you might need to lower down some settings in order to average 60 FPS. Cyberpunk 2077 also ran decently on the system as it had no problems playing it on 1080p, averaging 74 FPS with 1% lows of 56. But at 1440p, you have to lower down some settings to play at an average of 60 FPS. This is to be expected as the RX 6600 is really not meant for 1440p gaming, especially on AAA titles. The system handled Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 easily as it was able to average 86 FPS on the extreme preset of 1080p. Playing on 1440p is also possible, but it would be better if you lower down the settings to at least medium to achieve better FPS averages. Here's a rundown of the games I tested on this setup. The PC can run most games above 60 FPS on 1080p even if it's in the highest settings. Lowering down some settings will of course give you more FPS, so consider doing that if you favor better performance over graphics. Playing on 1440p is certainly possible with this setup. However, you might need to manage your expectations as you might encounter low frames, especially on graphically demanding AAA games. Again, lowering down some settings will give you better numbers, so gaming on 60fps in this resolution is still achievable. Overall, this setup is a solid sub-1000 US dollar PC, capable of playing most games on 60fps 1080p resolution. And with 32 gigs of RAM installed in it, this setup is also capable of doing heavy multitasking and editing. Hopefully, my friend who commissioned this build will put it to good use. On that note, we end our video. If you like the video, show your support by liking it and consider subscribing to the channel. As always, thanks for watching. See you on the next one.